Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS today with Avik Sarkar, who's going to talk today about power sign-off. We've heard a lot about some of the problems with uh, power, power sign-off leading up to that. What are you seeing in design? What are you hearing back from customers? And what are some of the major problems that you're starting to encounter that didn't exist before? Ed, so that's a great question, especially as our customers move more and more into FinFit based designs, they're moving into sub 60 nanometer in a mainstream flow. So then they start to look at voltage drop as a very critical problem because the headroom that they earlier enjoyed at one plus voltage supply levels do not exist anymore. These devices, which are being used for higher performance, don't operate as well if the supply voltage droops by another 100 or 200 millivolts. So then, if you have to ascertain what is going to be the voltage drop on your chip, you have to look at a couple of areas. You cannot just look at the chip by itself. You have to bring in the chip, the package, and the board together. So what, why do you need to do that? What's behind that? There are two parts of it. One, it's to your advantage that you look at these three systems holistically. When you design a system to deliver power robustly, from the battery or from the regulator all the way to the transistor, you typically have a margin. You would say, let's say, 200 millivolt drop across the whole thing, or let's say 100 millivolt drop. Now, if you were to solve the chip and the package and the system individually, then you would tell the chip person out of the 100 millivolt, you have 60 millivolt. You take, tell the package person you have 30 millivolt and the PCB 10 millivolt. Now, all of a sudden, you created boxes or boundaries for these individual teams. So why don't you draw this out for us? Absolutely. So if you have the chip, then you have the package, and you have the PCB. And they're all obviously interconnected with each other. Now, going back to the earlier example I said, you define boxes or boundaries or margins, whatever way you define it. And you say that, solve this for me, solve this for me. Now, you limit the chip person to 20, 70 millivolt, the package to 20 and 10. Now, they may over-design because they don't have any more headroom. So what does that matter? how does that impact them? A, the schedule becomes longer because they have to fight against a 70 millivolt margin, especially if FinFET devices have higher drive strength currents and the local switching effects are much more pronounced. The package team now only has 20 millivolt. And for all operating conditions, they have to meet that. And same with the PCB team. Now, if you were to solve this together, you bring into one environment the chip layout, the package layout, the board parasitics, and you solve them simultaneously over multiple scenarios, then this you don't limit yourself to these smaller numbers. You have the entire 100 millivolt to play with. Now, all of a sudden, you don't need to specifically enlarge the chip or put more decaps inside the package, discrete package, uh, discrete decaps, which you can make it very expensive, or go for more layers on the PCB. So you're basically solving margin as a holistic part of the design, right? As opposed to individually in each unique area that, that has been separated in the past. That's right. And you want to do that for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, you are assuring yourself that you will operate across all three systems. For example, now that's obviously an over-design problem. What if you under-design? What if the package design team was not aware of a particular operating condition of the chip? And you design the package agnostic of the chip. You can actually end up having much more voltage drop than the chip could handle. So first is, are you able to meet the performance criteria and the uh, timing goals that you had set for yourself? The second is, are you able to optimize for the cost? Because you're designing across all three simultaneously, you're reducing the die size, you're reducing the components on the package, and the PCB elements itself. Now this, I just talked about power. This applies equally well to signal integrity, it applies to thermal, it applies to EMI design as well. So, so as we move down Moore's Law, margin becomes much more critical. You can actually Im uh, impede performance, you can completely blow your power budget by doing it wrong. What sort of problems are you seeing, and, and what's the uh, variability there in terms of what you have uh, percentage-wise compared to what you can, can or cannot do? So as we move down the advanced technology nodes, we have to rethink 
the way we have traditionally done design. The approach that we have taken of designing in silos, for example, timing, power, say DFM, all of these operate individually. Now, there is some information that possibly goes back and forth. When the timing team is working on meeting, you know, making sure all the parts have the right slack and everything, they, they may model in, let's say, 100 millivolt drop across all possible timing paths, irrespective of where the timing path lies. Or when you're doing power analysis, that's assuming one specific timing condition. So all of that is happening individually. Again, that's because the way we have traditionally done design, and that is again because of the way the tools have been architected and the tools have been capable of. Now, given that our headroom, the voltage drop headroom keeps on shrinking, it's no longer one volt, the supply voltage is sub 700 millivolt. Or the timing, you have to meet faster timing critical paths are getting more and more complex. So the traditional way in which we were solving these in silos is going to become a big impediment. First, in order to meet these goals, your schedule is just going to become longer because you'll be iterating and doing things on much extended period of time. The second, you are going to over-design the chip significantly. Because your power targets are more complex, you will have more metal layers, you will extend the die size, both for timing and power or DFM needs. So therein lies a very, very critical need, especially in the industry, to rethink and look at all of these holistically and to come up with a solution that gives people the coverage across multiple scenarios and also is able to handle the complexity of the chip in a really scalable manner. One of the issues that a lot of designers are dealing with is that they're getting so much data out of each one of the silos, though, that they have to now decipher all that stuff, and it's much easier to take this separately than together. Do we need to rethink that whole problem? Margining definitely allows us to have certain information that shields them from the other domains, and you create an envelope for yourself to operate in. But that was fine in the older technology nodes. If you're able to afford a chip that is 10, 20% bigger than what it should be, if you're able to have a design cycle that's a, you know, several months behind schedule, I think those would all work fine. But what I know from my customers, these are not something that they can live with anymore. Schedule is super and paramount for them. Cost is, especially the economics, of the advanced technology nodes, 16, 10, and 7, demand that the chip is as optimized as possible, the package is as optimized as possible, and the system as well. So, but the reason they look at it individually is, as you said, because that's the only way they have been allowed to do from the tool's point of view. So therein lies an opportunity to leverage some of the work that has been done outside. If you look at a chip today, a chip is as complex as the internet, for example, given the number of nodes, the number of elements, the number of connected objects all over. But the software techniques that we use are somewhat antiquated compared to what the internet uses to solve, for example, search or imaging or maps or what have you. So there is definitely an opportunity for us to look at what has been done and leverage it to solve these problems that we face. And what you're talking about here, to a large extent, is really a multi-physics solution across multiple domains, right? Absolutely. We call it multi-physics, multi-domain, and multi-variable. Now, why multi-physics? Because when you look at thermal, for example, it's the devices that are operating at the transistor level. They are generating the heat. That heat goes through all the interconnects on the chip, and they're generating through joule heating and other effects. Then it comes out, then you have to have a cooling solution that displaces that heat, and there is a fluid situation happening. Now, when the current flows through all the traces on the PCB, it also generates heat, and that can create a warpage or bending of the PCB. Now, let's say you expected the PCB to be exactly straight and everything, and let's say you have two or three high power chips sitting there. And these are obviously soldered onto the PCB. 
Now, because of the high current that is flowing across these PCBs, there is temperature getting generated, and this PCB may warp infinitesimally by a couple of millimeters. Then that ball that was supposed to be soldered here may actually get disconnected or get dislodged. So that robust electrical connection that you modeled your chip and your design on no longer exists. This is obviously a multi-physics problem. And this is only one example of it. Does it change at all when we get into some of the advanced packaging fan outs, 2.5D, 3D? Absolutely. And I think those are the situations where we are packing. These advanced packaging technologies are also supporting the most advanced chips or the most advanced technology nodes. Thermal issue becomes even more accelerated. So if you look at thermal, the way we see it, it's a three-tier problem. First, at the device level, you have the local self-heat problem. Then you have the chip interconnects, this particular metal stack. And then you have the package there. The temperature profile on the chip affects the electromigration, the ESD, the long-term reliability of the entire chip architecture that you have. And the third effect is at the system level. How do you cool it? What is the warpage and the stress that you're generating on the system? So this three-tier approach, these become increasingly critical as you look at these advanced packaging nodes. Now, there's also another aspect of it. We talked about thermal. You have to look at EMI. You have to look at signal integrity, power integrity. There are so many other variables. So we've been used to looking at reliability over a period of two or three years because what we're talking about typically is a mobile phone. You trade it in every few years and you're done. When we start getting into things like automotive, for example, those, these cars have to last 10 to 15 years. When you design a chip, it's got to be reliable for all that time. Does this take advantage of some of the need for uh, understanding the physics going into uh, aging of cars, uh, aging of components within them, how they're going to function over time? So if you're designing an electric motor, which for all the electric cars and all of that is a very, very critical component, if you design it for a particular electrical efficiency, but then there is vibration that's happening on it, there is temperature that is going to change its or deform its shape, is it going to retain its electrical performance under those conditions, under that vibration, under that thermal stress, all of it? So we have looked at these kind of multiphysic aspect over the years. So as electronics becomes a mainstream part of the cars, a lot of the learnings we are able to leverage and apply here. So let me give you one quick example. So if you're designing, a, let's, let's take the dashboard where you have, let's say, a rear view camera. And, and you have the radar also turned on. So if you turn, put your car in reverse and you're backing out, and if you're like me, you've probably gotten used to the radar in the back of the car doing all the work for you. So you probably are not looking over your shoulder to see if somebody is there. Now imagine for a second that you are in Las Vegas with a very high temperature and the chip has, for some reason, it has slowed down, its thermal sensor kicked in, it slowed down the chip, that the radar did not kick in or it did not send the signal from the back to your display. So while you're backing out, you're not hearing the beep, so you think it's all clear. In reality, the radar actually didn't even kick in. So in that scenario, what happens if you bump into somebody or into something? So those are the problems that automobile manufacturers worry about, is when you design a chip that was for a mobile application and you take it and put it in an infotainment or in the center display, is it going to operate just as properly as it did on your mobile handset in that Las Vegas temperature under those demanding conditions? And this is all part of the end-to-end -end design and uh, sign-off, right? Absolutely. When we say end-to-end -end design, we are not just limiting ourselves to chip packet system. We are looking at software. How does software, the embedded code that runs and controls all of these, how does that influence the system? And when it drives a particular component on the system, how does it behave and how does it influence all the other components that are there? So when we look at it in totality, it's a system problem. And we have to look at creating models of individual components, put it together and solve it holistically at the full system level. We've been talking about system engineering as a discipline for quite some time. Are engineers capable of spanning these different areas? When we started uh, 
going into chip packet system design back in 2006. At that time, even bringing a package into a chip simulation was a somewhat of a foreign concept for most of the design community. Nowadays, when I go and visit customers, it's almost given that you have to look at chip package together. More and more customers are thinking about bringing the PCB into consideration. Sometimes the PCB is done by an external system partner, so they start to share data and handshake. So there is obviously a mind shift change that's already happening. It's progressing, but it's, it's very good work in progress. Avik Sarkar, thanks very much for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.